All right. Well, hey, let's get this thing started, folks. So, hey, uh, good day. Happy Friday, everyone. Welcome to Defender Fridays, your weekly rendezvous with the forefront of information security. So I am Eric Capuano. I'm part of the dedicated Lima Charlie team, and it's my pleasure to guide you through this unique series of insightful fireside chats. At Defender Fridays, we delve into the dynamic world of information security, exploring its defensive side with seasoned professionals like our guest today, Lennart Koopman, um, from all across the industry, right? And our aim is simple yet ambitious to foster a collaborative space where ideas flow freely, experiences are shared, and knowledge expands, right? So as I mentioned to you all last week, our goal, our aim is to bring on new and awesome guests from all across the industry each week. Last week, you, you got to hear a little bit from me, uh, but this week we do have uh, uh, a, a new guest coming on joining us. Lennart Koopman is not only a, a fantastic practitioner, the um, uh, former founder of Greylog, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Um, he's also now um, uh, uh, launching a company called, well, launched, it, you, en Enzyme's been around for a little while, but a company called Enzyme, which focuses around uh, uh, network security and, and kind of intrusion detection and things of that nature. And so we'll get to hear more from him on that as he also dives into a really exciting topic detecting DNS exfiltration, which when he when he suggested that topic, I was like, dude, that's fantastic because it's absolutely a vector that we know adversaries use. But I also think it's one that defenders are probably pretty poorly equipped and 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 and, and you know informed on, right? And so I was like, this is a great topic to hear from, hear from you on. Uh so Lennart, yeah, tell us a little bit about what you're up to these days and let's talk about DNS exfil. Sounds great. Uh yeah, thanks for the Thanks for the intro. I feel like this might be the first Zoom we're on, Eric uh, and Whitney also, that we we have not told the story how we met in Vegas once. Uh, we're going I, to do that if we have like two more minutes left. Um, <laughs> but we, we know each other for, for a pretty long time now. Yeah, um, yeah so I, I want to talk about DNS exfiltration. Um, keep it kind of high level because it's, you can go pretty deep on that topic. And and I, I sent Eric some suggestions when he asked me if I can come um on this uh, uh on this uh, presentation today um i sent him a few ideas of what i could talk about and kind of because um the the series is pretty new so i wasn't really sure kind of what the 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 theme or the topics should be like so i sent him some a few uh, a few suggestions and dns exfiltration was in there because i have spent uh a few weeks recently uh implementing a dns exfil detection um, in the enzyme sensor. I'm going to just mention enzyme in like one or two more sentences in a second. But um, so part of that is, of course, to understand how attackers are using DNS exfiltration so you can properly write detection rules for that. And this is one of those that stuck with me because it's 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 really a fascinating topic just because it has so many so many nuances to it. It's not just like, oh, you just send a bunch of UDP packets on, on, on port 53. There's actually much, much more to it. And also you can get really creative when it comes to the detection of it. And there are some really cool tools out there that exist already to actually run something like this. So part of that, um, of what I did is I actually ran DNS exfiltration into, uh, into a lab environment. Um, and that's actually really cool to see. And that was a really, uh, really interesting experience. Um, I made a few slides to guide us through this. Um, so I don't know if screen sharing is enabled. It should be, but hold on. I know what I might mm -hmm. need to do is make you a host and then you should yeah. be set for sure. And they should be, those are not going to be boring. I promise. Oh, <laughs> <it's not. laughs> Let's see. Share screen. There we go. Uh, and I will allow Zoom. This is also a new computer. Uh, so I have to allow Zoom to actually access my screen. I like that. Which Mac uh, OS, it might, it might make you uh, restart Zoom. We'll have oh, to. no. Yeah, no. Mac Mac is real picky. Okay. Uh, I'm going to do that real quick. So I'm going to be back in about one second. Okay. Sorry about I'll, that. I'm going to tell our story while you drop out. Yes, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> so so it is it is kind of a funny story. So um I bumped into I bumped into Lenart, oh geez, it must have been like 2015, 2016, walking out of the packet hacking village at DEF CON. And I was wearing a gray log shirt because uh, a project I was running inside the packet hacking village was using gray log. So I'm rocking the brands, love the product. And uh and then this guy, you know, comes comes walking my way in the hallway 
He's like, yeah, nice shirt. I'm like, yeah, great log. Have you used it? He's like, well, I wrote it. I'm like, oh my gosh, we should talk. And so that kind of started our uh, our conversation. And then for any of you that uh, that follow some work that uh, that Whitney and I did with the uh, Recon Infosec team some years back, uh, the OpenSock uh, Blue Team CTF was initially built on Greylog. And so it was so cool to have uh, the Greylog team that Lenart was kind of spearheading joining us and supporting us and helping us make that tool usable in a CTF with a thousand people beating up on it simultaneously. So our history goes back quite a ways and, and, and a lot of really cool twists and turns and fun stuff there. So yeah, Lenart, you're back just in time. I was just telling everyone every, all the way up from Packet Hacking Village to uh, to OpenSock and, and everything in between. So welcome back. Let's see if it lets you uh, share those those slides here. Yep, I think you have to make me a host again real oh, quick. Yeah, and then... yeah, I gotta promote you again. No problem. That's, when I came on like 10 minutes ago, I was joking and this is a new computer and I hope it all works. <laughs> it, it'll happen now. Of... It will happen. There we go. I see a preview. Beautiful. We fixed it. There we go. So you should see my yep. beautiful PowerPoint now. Okay, so uh, super quick introduction about me. If you hear a weird little accent, that's because I was actually born and raised in Germany. I lived there for about 28 years. Um, I am now living in Houston, Texas. Um, and um, I was previously, like and uh, like, like Eric said, uh, I was the founder and CTO at Greylock. Uh, started that company actually over in Germany. And when we expanded that into the US, I was the payload of that transaction um, and moved with it, basically. And uh, there is a whole, I can hold another 30 minute session of how I ended up in Houston and why it's actually a great place to live and eat. Um, but we'll do that at another session. Um, I left Greylock almost exactly a year ago, I think almost on the day. Um, and my last day was January 1st of this year. And um, I am now working full time on a new open source uh, software. It's called Enzyme, um, and it's basically a Wi-Fi and Ethernet network security platform. Um, like I said, it's open source currently in alpha. Um, alpha point six is actually coming out later today. The packages are always on, on already on GitHub. Um, if you want to play around with that, the website is still very, very preliminary. I would recommend to look at Enzyme on uh, Twitter or Mastodon because that's really where the the latest screenshots and updates and stuff are coming in right now. There's a big note on this whiteboard next to me that says update website, and I will probably eventually do that as well. It's currently only me, no VC money involved, uh, bootstrapping it, having a lot of fun. Uh, if you want to follow me, I uh, have here on the right, this is my Mastodon account. I do still have a Twitter account, but I mostly use it to retweet stuff. Um, I don't really read DMs on it, um, but you can follow me there, of course. And then there's also a website. I'm in the Enzyme Discord. This is my email address if you have any questions. However, today I want to talk about DNS exfiltration. I thought before we dive into DNS, um, what exfiltration really means, because everyone kind of understands a little bit uh, something else when it comes to the word exfiltration. Um, I would summarize it as to move data out of the victim network and into the control of the attacker. And that could be a few kilobytes for a private key. Um, there could be a few characters that might be of interest, could be a whole database dump, could be terabytes of data, right? Um, there are many methods, methods to do so. Um, you can, of course, simply open an SCP or an FTP connection. You can pipe all that data through a raw socket using NetCAD. You can make HTTP requests. Uh, you can use ICMP, DNS, which we're talking about today. Um, basically, and I think uh, uh, MITRE and the attack framework summarizes all of this as um, uh, forgot the exact name of it, but they summarize all of this around something like using an alternative protocol or basically sending different data through a valid protocol um, than what the protocol was intended for to use. And we're going to look at what that means for DNS in a second. Also very interesting, I find the physical or the closed access uh, world in this, as in someone could be in this office here right behind me and somehow exfil data. Um, this is, I don't think this is a risk for 99 point, I don't know how many 9% of people, uh, but there have been proof of concepts where people have exfiltrated data by making the um, uh, making the LED of a webcam blink, for example, right? Like if you can record that somehow from the other side or vibrations of a um, uh, vibrations of a hard disk or uh, ultrasound coming out of a speaker or uh, many, many other um, methods. But I think this is probably unlikely to happen to the vast majority of us. 
Um, and you could technically, I mean, you can morse out data with ICMP pings, right? Um, so you can get really, really creative when it comes to um, exfiltrating data from a network. And they can that can also be part of command and control infrastructure. So if you want to send out beacons saying like, hey, I am a piece of malware and I am here, owner, um, you can send that out. And of course, also to um, respond to commands that you might be sending into your attack infrastructure. So that is not technically ex exfiltration, but it might use very, very similar techniques, right? Um, and I think what's optional in all of this is it can be hard to detect or operating below known detection thresholds, as in you don't want to be detected, or you believe that you will be detected if you're not careful. There are certainly networks out there where you can just blast terabytes of data out with with FTP and people might not notice, right? This is, this is I think, up to the attacker and their, their understanding of the target network. Um, it can be fast or slow. Uh, again, depends on if you, if you think there is a risk of being detected after a while. Um, and of course, doing it faster often comes with a higher risk of being detected. Um, and it can be reliable or not. Um, it depends. Does, is it just a string that you, can, that you can reconstruct on the other side and you'll know that it's correct? Or is it a whole database dump and it has to make it over really bit by bit and in the, um, in the correct order and without losing anything? So a few variables in here um, and it's up to the attacker, I think, of how they want to exfiltrate data or get any data out of the network. Now, we're focusing on DNS and why is DNS for Xfil so interesting? Um, I think the most important part is that you really need DNS in your network almost always. Right. And the way that DNS is designed is working really in the benefit of an attacker here. So first of all, direct DNS to the Internet is often not blocked. I think there are many networks out there where all the clients are simply calling out to the ISP DNS server to 8.8.8.8 uh, .8 to the uh, I forgot what the quad is like one of those public resolvers, basically. And they're just communicating with that directly because it's a maybe a small company or a some sort of an environment where someone does not have their own DNS resolver and is blocking um, DNS traffic from anything else to the outside. So you can, of course, if that is the case, and if you feel like this is not going to be detected, and that's what many people think of when they think of DNS tunnels and DNS exfiltration, you can, of course, go and send your DNS payload directly to a DNS server under your control, or probably pretty much anything else if there's no traffic inspection, um, and just blast out stuff UDP port 53, right? If that is the case, you can probably do that. Um, and I think that's how, how a lot of Excel methods actually work. However, because of the distributed nature of DNS, um, even if um, DNS, and I think this is a typo here, even if DNS is blocked, um, then there will be an internal DNS server that will resolve your request, right? So let's say, I'm here on this uh, Mac studio and I am requesting google.com. It will in fact go to this server that's sitting here behind me because I haven't assembled the rack yet because I just moved into this office. Uh, it will go to that server. That server will say uh, google.com. Yep, I got that in my cache. And it's gonna return that IP address, the CNAME, whatever to me. Um, if it's a new request, which eventually this will have been a new request or it has the, the, the TTL is over for the cache time, it will go to its resolver and ask that resolver for google.com, right? Because it might simply not know, or it might have expired. Or if it's a new domain, like for example, freeipad.biz, which I'm not associated with, and I'm, I wanna be very clear, I'm not implying they are distributing malware in any way, but I, I, I like that as like a weird domain name. Um, let's say I'm requesting freeipad.biz. What happens is my DNS server is gonna ask whatever it's configured to, let's say 8.8.8.8, and then that one will say, I don't know that one either. And it kind of cascades until it reaches your DNS server, which is the uh, DNS server that, that hosts that zone. So that request is eventually going to make it to yours, right? If it's not cached in between, which, and even if it's cached now, that means at least once it has hit your DNS server to answer that request. So for DNS to work, at some point, your DNS server has to answer that. And what you can do if you don't want to directly send UDP to port 53 of your server and your tunnel host is um, you can encode the information that you want to exfil in DNS requests. So 
The DNS queries usually have to be RFC compliant or they will likely be dropped somewhere on the way. Like the resolver that sits behind me is just going to be like, that's not a DNS query. It's just going to drop it, right? Um, there is no arbitrary payload field. So there's not like some sort of a byte array that you can just put into a DNS request. Um, and But however, you can encode data in the subdomain that you're requesting. So let's say you do own freeipad.biz or whatever domain, right? Um, you can... Uh, you can point that domain, the NS record of it, to your own server that can be running anywhere. That can be a digital ocean droplet. That can be a, really anything that can run a DNS server. So now that server will host any request, any uh, any DNS request um, from any resolver out there. And he has to figure out where free iPad.biz lives. Um, and you can encode that information with, for example, base64. So let's say you want to encode, you, know, you want to exfil the string super secret data that better not ever be stolen, right? You can base64 encode that and then simply send a DNS request for the base64 encoded value dot free iPad dot this. That goes to the DNS resolver. That one says, I don't know that domain and asks our DNS or asks our DNS server, which has now received, um, which has now received the following subdomain. And on the other side, I simply take that value and I base64 decoded, and now I have that data. If and, I have yeah. a one terabyte, yeah, sorry, Eric. And I just want to add one one thing, like, and, and you've covered this, but I just want to restate it because this is an important thing for defenders to know. The, the thing that makes this so effective is that like that DNS query isn't going to some malicious place. It's going to Google, right? Or it's going to Cloudflare. And so if you're just looking for bad IPs showing up in your seam or in your, your, your firewall logs, you're not going to find them in this case because these are normal DNS re resolvers that we're talking out to, right? It's being right. relayed. Yeah, that's wild. From, from your visibility, from whatever you can as a defender see and record, you will not see a connection to any free iPad.biz or any of my IP addresses. It will go to something that's most likely extremely legit and something that receives a lot of traffic already, namely all your other DNS requests, right? And that makes it so interesting. Um, you can put up to 250 characters. Uh, um, it's ASCII, actually. You can put up to 250 ASCII characters um, into a request query. And there's benchmarks out there that gives you up to 56 kilobit um, of average throughput. Now, if you want to um, exfiltrate a one terabyte um, uh, 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 database dump, for example, you simply cut um, pieces of that and send one DNS request after another. And it's up to you to say, do you just want to blast them out as fast as possible? Or do you maybe want to wait a minute in between each of them to be uh, harder to detect? Of course, that that then influences how long it takes to exfil that. Um, and then there is um, software out there, um, pretty well maintained, that is basically an entire DNS server that does the sequencing, the reassembly and everything. And you literally end up with the same file on your DNS server um, after um, after a while. So there's there's software out there that does that. That's really, really, really hard uh, to detect. And today we want to talk about detection, right? So luckily, and I'm going to go through this and then I'm going to open it for questions. Um, there are luckily some ways for detection, but it's really hard to get anything out of the box. So you as a defender, I think will have to think about this um, and it starts by collecting your DNS logs. I think that's one of the most important things that you can do. Um, that could be at your local DNS resolver. So if you run your local DNS server, um, definitely connect those logs, send them into a log management system, into a SIM, um, or using packet capture. That's what Enzyme does. Um, that's listening on a mirror port, listening on a tap, um, and it reassembles this directly off the wire and is recording all of your DNS requests. Then what you can do is you can alert on, for example, and there's two more slides here coming with more detection methods. You can, for example, alert on strange looking DNS requests because let's face it, that's a pretty strange looking DNS request, right? That's probably a little odd. Um, so you can detect things like base64 and other formats. If an attacker is lazy and they, for example, leave the um, I think it's the padding in the base 64 that's the that's off the, the 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 two equal signs. You can start to detect on that. So some IDSs out there are looking for something that looks for that looks like base 64. 
Um, there are some that are trying to simply base 64 decode it and see if there's if there's ASCII letters coming out on the other side, right? Um, that's something that you could do. There are other formats. Look at some of those existing um, uh, uh, DNS exfiltration tools and see what formats they're using. Um, string entropy, that is something that, that I implemented in, in Enzyme, is you can, you can look at the entropy or the randomness of the letters in the DNS request. So, for example, let's say someone opens assets.freeipad.biz, which might be a legit domain, that has an entropy of 3.43. If someone opens this entire string, which, which was our XFO request, that already has a 4.82, and that was a pretty short string. So what you can do is you can baseline the, um, the entropy of your legitimate request, or simply over everything, and then those that are part of exfiltration, they will stand out. Um, and uh, you can use... I think this is a great use case for anomaly detection and for statistics, um, and you can find outliers in that. And you can even alert on that. Um, that is a fairly reliable method. The problem is sometimes you'll hit things like um, Cloudflare subdomains have an extremely high entropy. Um, they look like exfil, but they're not. So you will have to, as always, you will have to tune your false positives. Um, you'll have to get a little smarter uh, uh, about this. Also, string length. Um, it is unlikely that there is a machine that is requesting 250 character long, um, uh, uh, is resolving 250 character long host names all the time. Um, that's another thing that you can look for and alert on and also simply find a baseline of what's the average length and is there something that's significantly larger than that, right? Um, again, for that, you need your DNS logs. You have to, have to, have to collect the DNS requests that are leaving your network. Another thing that I like a lot is domain registration age. Um, the domains that are being used for DNS exfiltration are often pretty new, only recently registered, um, simply to avoid ending up on threat intelligence feeds, right? Um, so you can find those sets in the WHOIS data. Um, and I think even like the, the um, if you have like privacy protection and stuff on your, on your domain, I think you will always get the registration age. I believe that always comes out of that. Um, that's of course something your SIM has to support, your log management system has to support. You don't want to do that in real time um, because who is is pretty slow. Um, and then of course, yeah, if you want, use threat intel feeds of domain names. Again, I think every serious attacker is going to register a new domain and not pop up on those, but then you might be able to catch them through um, the uh, through the registration age. Um, and once you detect something, you I think you want to block that domain automatically at your local DNS server um, and alert on it. I think that's something that if you have a pretty high confidence in the detection, um, that's something that you can do. Um, and you can also then further um, reduce this by the top level domain. So you could say, okay, never do this for dot coms, but always do this for a dot biz, for a dot shop, like all of those new domains, right? Just to make sure that you don't ex accidentally block like something really, really important. I think that's smart about that as well. And then the NX domain. Um, NX domain is the error code that DNS, a DNS server will respond with if the domain doesn't exist. So if you just try to resolve a domain that simply doesn't exist, you'll get an NX domain back. Um, count those because that can indicate algorithmically generated domain probing. Um, some malware is using, I think it's called DGA, right? It's a domain generation algorithm. Um, so they will algorithmically generate random domains that then on the other side are being registered also over and over and over again. Um, however, they might not know when those are available immediately or someone might have simply blocked those already or, or deleted them. Um, that will then end up in NX domain responses and you can also count on those. So if there is a high number of NX domain responses and you'll get a ton of them all the time, but if there's an outlier in that, that's another really interesting to look at. And of course, you can do some threat hunting on it, um, which I honestly think is probably the best way to detect this because this is one of those things where you need to look at a domain name and see is this odd or not, right? This here, if I see this domain name, I'm, I'm going to be very alerted by that as a human. For a computer, this is going to be hard to differentiate between a, a, a legitimate random string before a Cloudflare worker. URL uh, domain, right? Um, so by having human eyes involved and human thinking and humans knowing about the context of maybe the machine that requested that, um, you can avoid a lot of false positives, I think, and also um, find additional stuff. So one thing you can do is sort for the least common domain names. 
right? There's going to be google.com, facebook.com, instagram.com. They're all going to be on top. They're going to have millions of requests. Ignore those, reverse sort on the least common, and then scroll through those. See if there's something odd in there. Exclude the top 1 million domains. They are unlikely to be attacker infrastructure. Um, find the domains that have the most subdomains per domain, because that's where a lot of the actual data is going to be in. So find those that have thousands of subdomains. Probably odd, probably unusual. Um, look at the request type volume. So who's requesting a ton of TXT records? That could be odd. Ton of C name, but never any never any um, A or, or AAA on the other side. No, they're weird, weird request types that you can look at. Um, you can, I think Splunk lets you do that and probably other systems as well. You can calculate entropy. Um, you can look at the length, find outliers yourself, uh, put those on a histogram, very interesting. And always, always, always look not only at the request volume, but also the size or combine them. Um, and I think with all of that, um, you do actually have a pretty good chance to, to detect these kind of things, but um, hard to detect automatically without generating a ton of false positives. So I think threat hunting really important. And please, please, please collect your DNS logs um, and collect them as early as possible because that will allow you to build a baseline of what normal DNS logs are. So I got a couple of thoughts, Leonard. So, mm -hmm. um, so let's, let's talk about collecting logs because obviously for defenders, that's step one, right? Because you can't you can't detect on what you're not collecting, right? So, so okay, great. So we want to collect uh, DNS telemetry. Well, that's that's an easier easier thing said than done, right? Because <laughs> it's like, well, where do I collect that from? You know, you may choose to ingest DNS uh, server logs, right? So your domain controllers, your info block suppliance, or whatever it is you're using internally for DNS, but the reason I would encourage you to maybe think a little bit bigger than that is because you're assuming that every client is using your internal DNS resolver exclusively, but that's actually a tough thing to enforce, right? Uh, and, and a few, if any orgs I've ever walked into had that level of restriction applied where if you tried to use 8888, it's not going to let you out. You have to use their internal resolver. So just know that if you're only collecting telemetry from that on-prem resolver, you're not seeing all DNS. You're seeing maybe most of it, but you're definitely not seeing all of it. So then how do we how do we get better telemetry, right? Like so Lenart, like I don't know what your what your thoughts or approach would be, but my my opinion is, hey, if I can at least get, you know, kind of that that herd immunity by having EDR or, you know, an EDR agent or something that can stream telemetry off the endpoint itself. That way, no matter what resolver it's using. Right. If if it's using 8888 or, or 1111 or whatever, I'm still capturing it at the endpoint level. Now, obviously, there's still the issue of well, what about systems I don't have my agent on? Right. So I'm not saying it's a perfect solution, but like, do you have any thoughts on that? What would be the most comprehensive way to get all the DNS traffic in a network? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, it's, I think it's two things. What is the, the lowest hanging fruit and what is the most comprehensive? Right. And I think both are not super hard. But for example, um, yeah, if I open my uh, my Lima Charlie account, I see all the DNS requests in there. Right. And I can I can forward them somewhere else. Um, I think that's that's what you're saying with with endpoints. Absolutely. Because that's probably also the highest risk of where those are, because is someone really going to I mean, they might. But I think it's you get a pretty good coverage from looking at your EDR logs um, that record these DNS uh, queries. But then, as you said, you don't have EDR in everything. Um, and uh, so uh, what Enzyme does and what other tools like like Zeek, uh, uh, formerly known as Bro, um, is also doing is um, they're reading traffic directly off the wire and they can write that to other systems. Um, I think Zeek can write it to a local log file that you can then pick up and ingest into your into your SIM. Um, that will give you these nicely parsed um, uh, DNS requests that went over the wire. And I would say for most comprehensive, um, have a sensor at your egress. So wherever something leaves to the internet from your environment or environments, um, record all DNS requests that are leaving um, in that in that direction and um, collect those. I think yeah, that's the most comprehensive because now you can't miss them, right? I had to, I had to drop a solution in the chat just now. Uh, one of my favorite open source full packet capture solutions is uh, Archimy, previously known as Moloch. Um, if you haven't played with that or heard of that, that's one to check out. Even if it's just for your home lab, uh, get that thing plugged into a span port or something and just start feeding traffic and it will blow your mind. Love the topic. Leonard, my, my, my last thought, and this, this is a bit controversial, but you know, talking about looking at you know, entropy in those DNS queries is obviously a, a winning move. But as you mentioned, there's, there's a false positive nature to that as well. 
dare I say, this might actually be a pretty realistic um, uh, application for you know uh, an, an ML ag algorithm, right? Because obviously it would be quick work for an algorithm to learn over time, like, okay, well, you got these high HP domains coming from Cloudflare and et cetera. Now we're just looking for least prevalent of the high entropy, right? Like show us the new, the rare, the, the uncommon across a large data set might really reduce the false positive nature of that approach. Absolutely. Uh, completely agree. I think that uh, machine learning um, statistics are, yeah. are fantastic for that. I mean, entropy already sounds like a statistics course. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. think it is because uh, you can, that's, that's numbers you can work with and you got a lot of numbers. And I think that's always a great yeah. opportunity for statistics. And then, yeah, visualize it so a human can interpret it or um, have a machine alert on it automatically. I think both is possible. Um, I would combine it, honestly. Absolutely. That's absolutely. All right. Well, hey, Leonard, uh, thank you so much. If you don't mind dropping your screen share here for a second, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up because we are at the top of the hour, folks. Hey, thank you so much to everyone that joined us here for our second uh, Defender Fridays episode. Um, I want to throw out a reminder. I dropped a link in the ch uh, chat here. Uh, join our Slack channel. We've got a Defender Fridays channel inside the Lima Charlie public Slack where we can keep the conversation going uh, throughout the week. Also, we will drop a consolidated summary of all the links and the resources and awesome stuff that was shared. We'll get that posted in that channel as well. Um, and otherwise, have a fantastic rest of your Friday, a great weekend, and we will see you all next week. Uh, thanks so much for joining us, Len Art. We'll uh, chat with you soon. And one last thing I'd love to do. Um, so another thing, the panelist form that went out, please fill out that panelist form if you'd like to join us with your camera on and the ability to unmute yourself, because something that we love to do at the end of these episodes is take a little screenshot of those that want to be part of our, our kind of family photo we'll take each week. So for those of you with your camera on, I'm taking that as consent to be included in our screenshot. And I'll give you a real quick countdown here in just a moment. Three, two, and one. Awesome. Got it. So um, thank you so much again, Lenart. Uh, for everyone else, we'll see you uh, next Friday. Take care and have a great weekend. Thanks, everyone. That was fun. See ya. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Lenart.